How do you imagine ancient megaliths, perhaps Stonehenge in England or the Great Pyramid of Giza in Egypt come to mind? They've become household names. Millions of people visit these sites every year. But thousands of miles away from such tourist hotspots, there is a mystery. Ruins of a city that is several hundred years old. And it doesn't sit in a desert or on a grassy plain. Its former inhabitants constructed it on a coral reef in the middle of the Pacific. The tiny island nation of Micronesia lies between Hawaii and the Philippines. The country is composed of 600 islands and islets. Because of its remote location, very few people visit Micronesia. The little tourists they have mostly come to go scuba diving in its azure waters. They often miss the opportunity to visit the only ancient city that stands on a coral reef, Nan Madal. Its home island is slightly smaller in size than New York City. Its ruins are made of heavy stone columns. There are walls and platforms, but one thing is missing – art. There are no ancient carvings to help archaeologists determine how ancient islanders constructed the site. Still, an international team of researchers was able to date Nan Madal. They presume that the history of the city goes back to the very end of the 12th century. For reference, these were the High Middle Ages in Europe, right around the time Richard I became the first king of England. In the Caroline Archipelago, where the island sits, this was the time when a powerful dynasty reigned over the island nation. Its chiefs ruled for a thousand years and unified the islanders. This enabled them to construct something as imposing as Nan Madal. One of the local legends said that the final resting place of the first of these chiefs was somewhere among the ruins. National Geographic launched an expedition to investigate this oral history. And sure enough, they discovered a tomb. It was the size of a football pitch. It featured a labyrinth of walls and passages, just like the ones found in the Egyptian pyramids. The list of similarities doesn't end there. The stone structure in Micronesia didn't seem to have a practical purpose, and a lot of effort went into building it. Its construction presents an engineering mystery for archaeologists. The same can be said for the pyramids in Egypt. The recently discovered tomb offers a clue. It contained an underground crypt which was capped off with a basalt stone. This is a volcanic rock that forms after lava cools down. It's dark in color and rich in iron and magnesium. The whole island is made of a similar volcanic material. It used to be part of an ancient volcano that eroded over time. Basalt boulders can be found all over the archipelago. They're in the shape of long hexagonal columns. The shape is not unusual and can be found all over the planet. Perhaps the most impressive site of basalt columns is Giant's Causeway in Ireland. These rocks formed from 1 to 8 million years ago. The locals probably sourced them from several quarries on the island. This is where the mystery begins. They each weigh several tons, so it's unclear how the natives transported them to the site. They had to navigate the entire width of the island and a lagoon covered with mangroves. These are dense shrubs and trees that grow near the coastline. And the size of the site is impressive. It spans close to 190 acres of a shallow coral reef. That's four times the surface size of Grand Central Station. As you might know, the Great Barrier Reef off the northeastern coast of Australia is the largest coral reef system on the planet. But it's a completely natural formation. The coral reef that supports Nan Madal isn't. It's man-made. Stone structures there rest on around 100 artificial coral reefs. The tribes that used to live in the area constructed each and every one of them. They stand at a height of about 3 feet above the waterline. Archaeologists were amazed by the clever building technique. Ancient builders would paddle out at low tide and retrieve coral from the surrounding waters. The conditions for it to grow fast here were perfect. Then, they placed parts of the coral inside underwater frames of stone. Once the first level was filled in, they added another row of stones and repeated the process. This allowed the foundation to rise above the water level. These islets were crisscrossed with tidal canals. The site had 12 walls to protect it against the sea. Harbors today still have similar breakwaters. 
the general layout of Nan Madal earned it the nickname the Venice of the Pacific. The coral base was strong enough to support the weight of all those basalt columns. Some estimates reveal that all the stones used in the construction weighed 250 million tons. This makes sense when we look at the largest monoliths on the site. These are massive stones that can be both artificial and naturally occurring. An individual cornerstone from the city walls weighs close to 55 tons, and there are several of them stacked on top of each other. The wall they form is higher than a telephone pole. In 1995, the Discovery Channel did an experiment for a special on non Madal. They constructed bamboo rafts to test how the ancient builders moved stones around. They were a fraction of the width of the real monoliths. The rafts sank almost immediately. The site's been sitting uninhabited for centuries now. The island's first settlers came by sea around the first century. Historians believe they arrived from the nearby Solomon or Vanuatu Islands. The city became a regional administration center at the end of the 11th century. Its heyday is associated with the powerful ruling dynasty. It lasted for nearly five centuries. European traders knew about the island for a long time. In the mid-19th century, the Spanish established schools there. In 1873, a Polish anthropologist was the first to systematically explore the ruins of the city. He found heaps of coral, simple bracelets, necklaces, and stone axes. There were also round discs with a hole in the middle that probably served as currency. In modern times, the island became part of Micronesia. Today, the local tribal chief is the supervisor of the ruins. His title dates back to the times of Nan Madal's builders but the locals cannot explain how exactly their ancestors erected the stone structures. The country's former top archaeologist was once quoted saying, We don't know how they brought the columns here, and we don't know how they lifted them up to build the walls. Researchers from around the world were determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, quite literally. In 2019, an American team of scientists performed the first ever LIDAR scan of the site. This type of radar uses laser wave pulses to scan under the surface of the Earth. This allows the technicians to create a 3D image of the ground below. The scan revealed a complex irrigation system on the tiny island. This probably explains how ancient Micronesians were able to supply the nearby settlements with drinking water. When it comes to food, it was probably boated in. According to the local population, historians estimate that at the time of the city's construction, 20 to 30,000 people lived on the island. In 2016, UNESCO inscribed Nan Madal as a World Heritage Site. The future of the city is uncertain because of the state the waterways are in. They're overgrown with mangroves. The vegetation is undermining the existing structures, and more can be done to promote the place as a tourist attraction. The site gets about 1,000 visitors annually. Compare that to 50,000 people who visit Easter Island each year. Both destinations are pretty far away from the nearest mainland. The distance from Nan Madal to California is more than twice the length of the Mississippi River. Imagine a place that could literally start at one end, trek over 1,800 miles straight to the west, and still be stuck under that massive canopy. This place is like a haven for all sorts of crazy creatures, hosting around 10% of the world's species. It's always been seen as this wild, untouched paradise where humans haven't messed things up yet. You know, like a glimpse into how the world used to be before we spread like wildfire across every continent, causing chaos everywhere. I'm talking about the Amazon region. That massive jungle turns out to be hiding some seriously cool secrets. For centuries, people have been talking about these lost cities deep within the forest. We're talking about El Dorado, the legendary city of gold that had Spanish explorers going crazy venturing into uncharted territory, never to return. And even in the 20th century, the adventurous Perry Fawcett went looking for the lost city of Z and disappeared into the jungle, leaving us all hanging. Scientists have actually found evidence that ancient cities did exist in the Amazon. But how did they find these hidden ruins in such a dense and remote forest? Well, they've got this awesome technology called LIDAR. Basically, they hopped into a helicopter and used light-based remote sensing to digitally strip away the canopy and reveal the ancient ruins of a massive urban settlement around Llanos de Mojos in the Bolivian Amazon. 
The place was once home to the Kasarabi culture, which thrived from 500 to 1400 CE. They had these incredible urban centers with huge platform and pyramid structures. They even had raised causeways connecting different suburban-like settlements spread across miles and miles of land. These guys were seriously ahead of their time, and they had an epic water control and distribution system with reservoirs and canals. So yeah, the Amazon rainforest wasn't just some untouched wilderness. It was actually heavily populated and even urbanized for centuries before recorded history of the region began. But the thing is, a bunch of people turned a blind eye to the fact that there were actually some pretty cool architectural sites lurking around here that totally deserve some exploring. Scientists predict that in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to uncover a ton of these cities, and some might even be bigger than the ones we're talking about here. Michael Heckenberger, an anthropologist with the University of Florida, points out that we've seen some similar settlement features, like moats and causeways, in other parts of the ancient Amazon. This new research reveals something totally mind-blowing. Past examples of urbanism in the Amazon were more like groups of villages connected together, not quite what we'd call urban. You see, they were missing those fancy larger centers with their grand architecture and stuff. But guess what? Yanas de Mojos has got them. This place is the real deal when it comes to a fully urbanized Amazonian landscape. So, in the Llanos de Mojos region, a bunch of ancient settlements have been found. These were home to the Kasarabi people, who were all about hunting, fishing, and farming maize. We're talking about hundreds of sites spread across 1,700 square miles. But these sites were so remote and hidden in the tropical forest that it was like trying to find a proverbial needle in a haystack. A team of archaeologists weren't going to let that stop them, though. They decided to take to the skies and use some fancy LiDAR mapping technology. Just imagine an aircraft flying over the area, shooting out a bunch of infrared beams. These beams hit the ground and bounce back, giving us the distance to different objects. It's like creating a super detailed map from above. Using computer software, these genius scientists were able to strip away the trees from the images revealing the Earth's surface and all the ancient archaeological goodies hidden beneath. And boy, did they strike gold! They found a whopping 26 unique sites, including 11 that nobody even knew existed before. So what about these 26 super cool sites? Among them, we've got Landivar and Kotoka, which are like these huge urban centers. And get this, we already knew they existed. But the new maps revealed they cover one and a half and one half square miles, respectively. These centers are surrounded by moat and rampart fortifications, like something out of a medieval castle. And they've got all sorts of crazy stuff inside. We're talking artificial terraces, massive earthen platform buildings, and pyramids that reach over 70 feet tall. All these epic buildings are actually facing the north northwest. It's like they were trying to align themselves with the cosmos or something. This kind of cosmic worldview can be found in other ancient sites in the Amazon, too. Now, let's take a bird's-eye view and strip away all those pesky trees. We can see these two centers in all their glory, and they're actually connected to a whole network of settlements through a bunch of causeways. Picture it like spokes on a wheel, stretching out for miles. Canals also stretch out from these main centers and connect to rivers and Laguna San Jose. It's like they had their own water delivery system going on. These ancient guys totally reshaped the whole landscape with their crazy cosmology. The only bummer is that their impressive architecture was made from mud brick. While it looked amazing back then, it just wasn't as durable as the limestone used by the Maya. What happened to the Kasarabi and their settlements is still a big mystery. But based on dating at the sites, it looked like they disappeared around 1400 CE way before Europeans arrived in the Amazon. One theory is that a massive drought hit the region and messed everything up. The researchers found these massive water reservoirs at various sites, which is pretty interesting, considering how rainy the Amazon is known to be. Who knows if they were for drinking water or farming fish and turtles? But hey, severe droughts have happened in the past, and it only takes a couple of bad harvests to make people pack up and move on. What's even more interesting is that these communities thrived in the same area 
where this guy Fawcett we mentioned before went missing while searching for his lost city of Z. Maybe he was onto something after all. This is how it was. Fawcett stumbled upon this super cool document called Manuscript 512 at the National Library of Brazil. It's believed to have been written by a Portuguese explorer. Now, according to this document, back in 1753, a group of explorers discovered the remains of an ancient city. It had arches, a statue, and even a temple with hieroglyphs. But the document didn't spill the beans on where the city was located. So Fawcett got all hyped up about finding this city and made it his secondary mission after his main goal of finding something called Z. At one point, he had to come back to Britain to run some errands, but in 1920, he decided to give it another shot. Fawcett went on a personal expedition to find the city, but it was unsuccessful. Five years later, Fawcett, his son Jack, and their buddy Raleigh Rimmel disappeared in the Mato Grosso jungle. Some researchers think that Fawcett might have been influenced by info he got from indigenous folks about this place called Kohikagu. Turns out, Kohikagu was discovered by Westerners in 1925, and it had the ruins of 20 towns and villages. Up to 50,000 people might have lived here. And get this, the discovery of other earthworks in southern Amazonia totally supports Fawcett's theory. In 2005, an American journalist wrote an article about Fawcett's crazy expeditions and discoveries. He called it the Lost City of Z. Catchy, right? Well, in 2009, he turned that article into a book with the same name. And in 2016, the super-talented writer-director James Gray made it into a movie. Now, here's where things get a bit sad. The Amazon region is changing rapidly. Farming, ranching, and energy production are changing this incredible place. And guess what? Those untouched areas with ancient relics won't stay untouched for long. It's a race against time to document and preserve what's left of our past before it's lost forever. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now, I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. 
In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals, such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. 
An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number one and two are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by Aeolian processes. That's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. 
They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization. Although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact type. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities, such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles, the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. 
explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set up to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explained why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fagera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fagaret Esaoya is actually named after Fagarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanats, said that the circles were definitely not Kanats. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity and cannots were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. 
Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara Circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost miss them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara Circles. You bring photos in the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara Circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure.